people are dialing in now. This is great. Welcome to our budget webinar on the 50% rule. It looks like uh, people are, are dialing in, so we'll get going in just a few moments. My name is Mark Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing, Communication, and Public Relations at the Peralta Community College District. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the third of three budget webinar um, programs uh, organized by Chancellor Walter and the finance team uh, to help inform you about um, matters of, of budget. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, while I'm doing that, uh, I wanted to um, um, let you know that while the uh, presentation is happening today, uh, you can submit any questions that you have through the Q&A feature. Um, uh, uh, in, in Zoom. Uh, and we'll be monitoring that th throughout the presentations and then we should have some time for Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, can everybody see the slides on the 50% law? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, with that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Walter. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you for um, being here to facilitate this uh, webinar. Um, and I want to thank everyone who is tuning in to learn more about our 50% law apportionment, advanced and periodic apportionments as well. So um, our presenters today are going to be our very own Adil Ahmed. He is our uh, acting vice chancellor of finance and administration. Um, Adil has a master's degree in accounting from Modadushi University in Somalia and a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in accounting from San Jose State University. Adil worked with the Somalia oil refinery as a controller and then became director of accounting and finance from 1983 to 1990. Adil has enjoyed a successful and enduring career in the education field, including working for the California Community College District since 2003, serving as a staff accountant, uh, business services supervisor, fiscal uh, service director, budget director, and of course, executive fiscal director here at Peralta Community College District. So thank you, Adil, for being here today and walking us through, teaching us how these uh, aspects are going to be working. We also have CM Brambat, who is um, a member or a part of the team from um, Cambridge West. He has um, been serving the educational community for a little over 35 years. And 24 of those years were spent with Coast Community College District as the Vice Chancellor of Administrative Services. He has an MBA and a BA in Accounting and audit, Auditing from Juriat University in Ahmedabad, India. Importantly, though, too, he has some special recognitions, one of which is being the recipient of the Walter Starr Robbie Award from ACBO. Association of Chief Business Officers in 2010. This award is presented to professionals in California Community College Business Administration who have demonstrated outstanding achievements and exemplary service as CBOs in their respective districts and in the state of California. So over his career, CM has garnered expertise in financial management, administrative services, cost savings, bond programs, state mandate compliance, capital construction, facility planning, and finance resources. And I would like to also thank um, our acting Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration, Adil Ahmed, for bringing CM to us um, and uh, being you know, really engaged with CM as a colleague and an expert in these fields. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Adil. Okay. Let me uh, explain a little bit about uh, the 50% law. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna do the 50% law, right, Carla? Uh, I think you're doing the apportionment glossary of terms first. 
Okay, so the, uh, the, <laughs> the way the way the apportionment works is because uh, for 2021, they said we will base the apportionment on on our prior year numbers, where we're lending on our prior year numbers. That will be our uh, apportionment for P1, and P2 will happen when we do uh, we'll submit our uh, FTS. Ado, wait one second. So let's, we have some glossary of terms here that we probably should uh, review for folks so they okay. understand our language. So maybe you can step them through the definitions of apportionment, apportionment calendar. And okay. Mm -hmm. So the apportionment is a funding to be distributed to an entity, community college district, CCD, or usually via the controller office electronically sending funds to the Department of Education office within the county, still so reside. Apportionment calendars. Uh, see slide three, for example, of CCD, which has a fluctuation of general apportionment budget. The advanced AD, information obtained by the Chancellor Office, CCCCO, that's the Chancellor Office, is used to determine the CCD's apportionment certifications. It means annual budget in mid July of each fiscal year. A portion of the budgeted state fund a general apportionment full-time faculty hiring fund are paid out based on percentage identified in the calendar. The Let first have, let's have um, maybe um, CM, can you do this slide? Sure, I can do this one and next one. And okay. I, want, I want people to kind of stay on this slide for a while because I don't want to read the slide. I want you to know how what it is. Uh, and basically, when we're talking about the apportionment, is basically how the funds arrive to the each district via the county treasurer's office. But those funds come not automatically. Those funds come because basically what are you serving, who you are serving, what you are producing. And from time to time, those reports need to be submitted. So, so when we're talking about the P1 report is basically how you have your fall schedule. So whatever you laid out as your fall schedule and whatever is the remainder left over from the summer for that year, those are the weekly student contact hours and all other different categories of the FTEs that you generate, whether they are credit, non-credit, uh, instructional service agreement, uh, incarcerated students, uh, CDCP, all those dollars, all those FTEs that what you are going to submit for the P1 report, which will be as of December 15. So when you submit this December 15, which we call the P1 report, which is a 320 report, uh, everybody knows as a 320 report, and those are there are three important aspects in this P1 report. Majority of the district, when they submit, they submit everything as a say, this is just an estimate, so let's submit whatever we need to submit and forget about it. Now, under the student center funding formula, there is a significant impact when you don't dissect each segment of your FTEs, whether they are credit, non credit, ISA, a high school student. So, if you give your report as of December 15 need to be submitted by January 15 to the state chancellor's office, then you will be able to get your funding. Some of the district also forget that this is an estimate of both the semester, your fall semester and your spring semester. So you also need to do the multiplying factor. Some of the districts are doing the multiplying factor of two, some districts do the multiplying factor of 1.95, some district does a multiplying factor of 2.05. Depends on the experience of the, each district in terms of whether they have a better fall or they have a the better spring. And if you don't have that confidence built within your system, you may be under-reporting those FTS or maybe over-reporting your FTS. So you really need to pay attention before you submit your report as a P1 on January 15. So the second thing happened is the state chancellor's office will take that report from all the 72 district and they will distribute the dollar based on what you have submitted as a part of your FTES. The P1 report will be certified 
on or after January 21st by the Department of Finance and the State Chancellor's Office, and that report will be released at the last week of February. So at that time, everybody will know exactly what are the dollars, what are the property taxes, what are the student fees, and maybe potential deficit for the remainder of the year as a starting point to see whether the state have enough money to pay for it or not. So this was until student center funding formula arrived. The student center funding formula have changed major portion of the apportionment. The 30% of the dollar now comes via student supplemental allocation or come with the student success. So the 20% of your apportionment dollar are tied with the supplemental allocation, which is based on the prior year data for your Pell recipient, AB 540, and promise student. So we are always a one year behind. So as long as you have your data file very clean, what you have submitted prior year, it will help you to build your confidence level at P1 because those numbers not gonna change. Those numbers pretty much going to get locked in when they're going to certify your P1 report in February. The student success will provide you a 10% of the dollar, but those student success dollar will be average of the prior three years. So you also need to pay attention when you do the 2021 that you will have 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, and divided by three, and now you're going to get paid for your 2021 at P1 report. So whatever comes at P1 is extremely important for the district because it's not gonna change the 30% of your dollar when it comes to P2 because those numbers are locked in. The only number will change is your FTAS, which is a 70% of the dollar. So that's the P1 and why it is important for you to pay attention to how you are developing your schedule, how you are serving your students, how you are yielding your FTEs. If, you, if somebody is not paying any attention to those areas, then basically the funding will be hammered because people are not paying attention to what your schedule look like, what students want, and how, what is your weekly student contact hour. So it's not a simple that, okay, what is P1? P1 is connected in every single aspect, every single thing you do on your dish, at your campus, whether it is student services, whether it is instructional, or even it is your VP of administrative services, because you wanted to make sure your facilities are up to date in order for your student to attend your classes whether now in COVID-19, you may have to be well prepared to provide your education online. Otherwise your FTS will be significantly hammered or significantly reduced and it will impact your funding going forward. So that's what the P1 is. I won't repeat everything what I did say that P1, but the P2 report numbers represent as of April 30th. This represents actual <laughs> the summer of the prior year, fall semester, actual of your spring semester, and estimated your positive attendance. You can also provide the estimate for whatever the upcoming summer is, also you can include in your P2 report. So when you are able to provide this data so nicely, to the chancellor's office, they use this data so clearly to certify. Because whatever you have it at a P2, those numbers can be used in a future years for the following years for quite a few of the dollars that you're going to get C, whether it is instructional equipment dollars, whether it is going to be your, your block grant dollars, all the dollars are based on your P2 number. So as much as it is important for your P1 to pay attention, you have to pay attention to your P2. Because 
whatever you're going to submit, you're going to get paid on June 26, 27. So the last week of June, when the fiscal year ends, just week before they certify the P2. Whatever you're going to get at the P2, those numbers will be, I would say, not say all locked in, but almost 99.9% .9 pretty much remain firm because there's not much change happen between your P2 and your annual reporting. So between the second principle and the recalculation take place, you have something called the annual FTS submission. That takes place on July 15. Whatever you have not included in your P2 report, that is your, at the end of the year report for your 320 reporting. So whatever that annual is, they will use the annual number to do the recalculation, which is R1. So whatever the dollar you did not got paid at P2, they will do the recalculation and they will provide those dollars in the following year in the February. So as you can see that we close our books in July and August, sometimes we don't get paid for an additional seven or eight months if the state owes us the money or if we collected, over collected, state don't take the money away from us until February. So we can use that money for seven, eight months if you have over collected. Majority of the time, over collection does not take place. Majority of the time is all, always under collection. So it is always state have to pay us in February. So this is how P1 works, P2 works, recalculation works but they are all connected with all the services the district provides. So everyone has to pay attention when it comes to developing a schedule, providing the student, excellent student services, make sure your numbers are thorough and have some kind of checks and balances so we don't report, under-report or over-report you underreport, you are going to lose the money. You overreport, you're going to take, they're going to take the money away and then you will be left holding the bag thinking that these are your money and it is not your money. So we have to pay attention. So the next slide is very clear. How do you get paid? The apportionment dollar, whatever the calculation is something called total computational revenue. They have a schedule and this schedule is already in Title V. Basically what they are saying that you will get paid 8% in July, 8% in August, 12% in September. All this is provided based on what dollars state have it, how the state can manage their own cash flow to provide the dollars. This has no impact on the district of how much you collect your enrollment fees. This has no impact on how you collect your property taxes. Your property, if your district is getting 80% of the money out of the property taxes, you will get very little money from the apportionment. If your district is only getting 10% of the property taxes, then every month you're getting a get lot more money from the state. So somebody had to pay attention in the district to develop a cash flow to see whether your cash flow is sufficient enough to pay your bills. And for that purpose, this schedule is provided to each district to see how you can manage your cash flow to pay your bills on a timely manner, month after month after month. Starting 2021, unfortunately, the state have a difficulty with the cash flow. So we are stuck with a huge amount of deferral starting this year. The last time they have started the deferral, it took four and four to five years before we remove all the deferral. So we just need to prepare ourselves how to manage those deferral and manage the cash flow. Thank you. It's my turn to speak about the 50% law and how it applies. 
So I'm just gonna give some a little bit some history about the 50% law. The 50% law started in California in 1961, I believe. And the uh, California state law has required each community college district to allocate no less than 50% of its expenditures, of its expenditures to salaries of classroom instructors. Well, with exception that we should, uh, there is some exception to that that we need to exclude. So we have the we have the education code section 84362 that uh, st uh, state exactly the 50% law and the California Code of Regulation 59204, and also we have the manual, the state manual regarding the the audit, the audit manual, which is our all the accounts that we use here and the explanations about uh, the state uh, uh, shot of account. Next slide, please. The 50% law, what it means. They shall be expend, expended during each fiscal year for payment for salary of classroom by community college district. We have to have a percentage of, meaning that we have to have expended 50% of our total, because we have a numerator and we have a denominator. The denominator is the instructionals and the denominator is all our expenses for the, for the education. So we should spend at least 50% of all our uh, uh, expenditures. Next, next slide, please. So this, we have also some uh, ex, uh, inclusions for the expense educations. Uh, the gross total expenditure for the purpose of classifying the final budget. You have the, uh, we have the, those who is listed here are not in our numerator. What numerator mean, we take the numerator is only the, uh, the instructors, salaries and benefit, nothing else. So we exclude all the academic salary, classical salary, employee benefit, uh, book on supply and equipment, anything else. Is, uh, those are the ones that goes on into the denominator. So please, uh, the next, next slide. So here we have the 50% law exclusion. What we exclude uh, for the 50% law, we exclude anything that are for um, capital outlet, debt services, any person that his salary is paid through uh, uh, the working on the bond, which are to the general fund. So all those things are excluded from our calculation. And also we exclude also um, of the students' the transportation, food services, any financial aid that we're doing through the fund one, all those things are excluded from the from the denominators when we calculate 50% law. Uh, like you, you know, like the category aid received from the federal or state government expenditure for facility acquisition and constructions, all those are uh, excluded. So we have what we call the activity suffix. So the instructions goes from uh, 100 to 5999, those are the instructional code in the state manual, are it? And then anything beyond above 67999, those are the non instructional uh, activity. Uh, next slide, please. So here we're continuing uh, the exclusion. So the lease agreement also is excluded in the lease agreement. And also it's not mentioned here, we exclude also the lottery funds that we're getting through the general fund is excluded. Uh, which help you know to, to reach our 50 percent law um, uh, I think that's yeah that's it so next 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 slide so for, so, so that shall object so here we have here is explaining exactly what we do our 50 percent law those are was a narrative what we should do here is exactly what you should take from your uh, uh, from your um, financial statement so we take the expenses from one to, to uh, one to five thousand for activities from hundred to six seven zero zero as defined in the BAM. So then, before I do that, I have to split this. So we take any any uh, um, activity, uh, a structure activity, which means it start from hundred to five nine nine nine, right? So those are my numerators: salary and benefit for the classroom people that are only teaching. And then I go to the other side, on the left-hand side, I will take all those expenses with the exclusion that the state allowing us to exclude. 
which is start from 6800 to until 7310. So then we look at our denominator and we divide the numerators by our uh, denominator. And we have to reach with all those exclusion, we have to reach our 50% flow. But before we do that, let's go to the next slide. In the next slide, we show you all the calculations. Next slide, please, uh, Mark. Here we go. So here is my the calculation for the 50% flow for 1819. Uh, couldn't do 1928 because we didn't close our book. So you're seeing here the instructional activity. Suffix 100. It start is a, about is, is an instructional activity takes business my memory is correct until five nine 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 and we add the sixty one ten so I'm taking here all the expenses salary and benefit as you can see from eleven zero one to uh, thirty nine twenty two so then I get my totals which is sixty two million salary and benefit including the retiree benefit and then I have to exclude the retiree benefit. The retiree benefit is excluded from the, numer the numerator. We exclude the uh, retiree benefit and then we have a total instructional after exclusion, which is the 59 million. So now if you go, uh, see, I don't see the other, uh, the denominator. Next, next slide. Here we go. So here is my next slide. So here is, you, here we're taking all the instructional activity and non-instructional activities. All is combined here. We just do the exclusions. We exclude anything that that is beyond activity suffix six, uh, 6800. All those ones are excluded. We're excluding the lease. We're excluding uh, anything that had to be excluded based on the state law. So if you go down uh, a little bit to Mark, please. So we have our current totals when we're adding all those salary and benefit and also uh, the book as uh, supplies and services. As you can see, we don't take the capital outlay here and we don't take the debt services. Those are exclu excluded already. So now we come up with a grand total of 131 million. Now we have to uh, exclude the retiree benefit uh, overall, which was 9.4 million. And then we exclude the lottery fund, the lottery that the, 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 the general fund are receiving, which is 3.8 million. And then also we exclude any lease, leases and fees, which was $1 million. And then if you go a little bit down, it will give you the total. I don't see it, but uh, we got, we're gonna get the total there. Uh, maybe the next slide, uh, Mark. No. So uh, just go back. So we're getting a total. Let's say that total. Then we devise our numerator, which, which was uh, the instructor, the instructor, the instructor expenditures uh, from uh, from uh, sal salary and benefit divided from from the total salary after exclusion, and that will give us a fifty point forty three percent over our um, our uh, uh, fifty percent law. And once we reach fifty percent, then we're good. So we reached our 50% as mandated by the state. If we don't reach the 50% law, there's a penalty to pay for each percentage that's missing. So we have to reach the 50% law. The 50% law is not something easy. We make sure that our expenditure, because the, the reason they're doing this, they need every dollar 50% should be spent on, a, on, a, on, a, on, the, on the classroom. So we have to make sure that we're reaching our 50% law so we don't have a penalty. A penalty is huge. Or if we can't reach the 50% law for, let's say, let's say for uh, 1920, we have uh, up to September to request a waiver. But when they give you this waiver for a year, but the following year you have to reach the 50% law or you're going to pay now. Because they give you one, 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 one year, uh, they give you one more year so you can reach your 50% law. So if we don't reach it in 1920, we, me and Dr. Walter will have to, uh, we have to request a waiver to the state chancellor and uh, they will grant you that waiver, but the following year, you must reach the 50% law. Or if you don't reach the following year, then there's a penalty. We have to pay uh, huge uh, money to the state. So that is what the 50% law is. And it's only calculated only on the fund one. Because I, I need, I remember a couple of years ago when Al, Al Harrison was there, 
we called the state if we could add uh, the parcel tax because we paying teacher because I said let's talk to them. I knew that we shouldn't because we don't do that. They, the bank all wanted to know if we could do that, and the state said no. It's only for the general fund. You can use to calculate the fifty percent law. It's only for the general fund. You can use the parcel tax. So Adil, let me um, thank you for that. But before you go forward, I would like to have uh, have some numbers read out to folks because we can actually see the bottom of the spreadsheet. So yes. turn, I'll start. I'll Mark, can you see those numbers? Or would you like me? Okay. Sure. So uh, at, the, at the bottom we get, when we, when we add up the right column, we get $131,462,054.37. And after the exclusions that Adil listed, the retiree benefits, the lottery, the license and fees, we have $117,084,723.48, which gives, um, which means that we are spending 50.43%. Uh, correct, correct. And this is audited. This is uh, a number that has been audited by the auditors last year, which was correct. There was no adjustment. Everything was uh, perfect. So the reason, the way we're getting the 50.43, if you divide the 59 million we had on the numerator uh, for the salary and benefit for the instructors and uh, divided by the total after exclusions, you will get your 50.43%. Okay, well, thanks. So we're going to move on now to the, um, uh, the, the schedule of monthly payments, and I'm going to have Adil kind of walk us through this too. This is pretty tiny, but in terms of uh, needing a yeah, bit of support, I, but Adil, <laughs> walk us through this. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, what, he, uh, what he explained, CM, and this is uh, regarding Peralta. As you can see, we had a certified amount regarding the general fund of $42 million. And then they give us how they're gonna pay us on a monthly basis. So we, so we can pay our bills. And uh, this is very important for our cash flow because the state is being, be paying us at the beginning of each month. So we can continue surviving and paying our bills. But as you can see, starting February to June, we're not gonna get any payment. Those are the deferrals. So we believe that we can see we got, we're having a good cash flow at, at this moment, but we still, me and Dr. Walter are uh, working on this to see if we need uh, to borrow money through the state or through the county. So we didn't make the decision yet, but that's where we at. So we're not gonna get uh, any money starting from February to June. They're gonna pay us a deferral mean. You don't know when they're gonna pay you. Maybe next year on July, August, September, we don't know. So we have to be prepared having the cash so we can continue operating, can pay our operations, uh, you know, uh, expenditures. So that's what, what it is. Uh, this is a schedule that we work through and we, we prepare our cash flow. So CM, can you give us any insight? I mean, I can talk a little bit about tax and revenue anticipation notes, but maybe you could just give us a thumbnail sketch of what those are. Sure. I think the majority of the district who are heavily dependent on property taxes more rather than their apportionment, they, their money normally comes in the month of November and December. They don't get much property taxes in July, August, September, October, and sometime even the November, they still have to pay the bills before they see the property taxes uh, in December. So some of those districts have provided you know, tax revenue anticipation notes. Uh, they can go to the market and can issue those tax re revenue anticipation notes for as small as a six month, nine month, 12 month, 13 month, 15 month, depends on what the needs are and where the, where the market is. This year kind of caused more problem for more districts because all of a sudden, pretty close to $1.5 billion is not going to be provided to 72 districts. And that particular institution, for any institution that creates a lot of challenges. Some institution can manage it for the first six months, but comes January and February, 
they may not have enough money to pay their bills for the remainder of the year because starting April, May, and June, they are not going to see almost any money coming from the state. So we have to make sure that we can still pay our own bills. So the district and the league uh, have done the pool of money. So the district can participate into the pool of trans pool where the district can have everything separate for their own district, but they get the better rate and lesser issuance cost because they're pulling all the district together. And they can have that for six, nine months or 12 month trans. Remember, all the trans need to be paid back. That's not a free money. Not only that, it does cost money because you still have to pay the interest to the marketplace. You might get by with a half a percent or three quarter percent interest rate, very cheap money right now. But at the end of the day, you are going to pledge some of your revenue in order to pay the trans back. So it is not something that you just wait for the last minute and say, oh, I'll pay all whatever you borrow, 25 million or $30 million and I'll write a check one day. No, they will not accept that. So as a part of the trans, the indenture that they prepare, they always attach something called property taxes that they will make sure that they have the first right to attach your property taxes to set aside and put the money in the, in the county treasury. So when the trans is due, they are guaranteed that they're gonna get paid. So okay. this is how the district have managed the cash flow. So yes. just, uh, just to uh, uh, let know uh, CM that our property taxes come only twice uh, a year. No, uh, it's, they come, they, majority of the property taxes come twice a year because the county yes. often have them on a December 10th and April 10th. Yeah, so, it comes to time, November or April. Sometimes they do send you some earlier because they get collections. So they have they have their own schedule, how they're going to distribute, similar to what we see for the portion. Sometimes the property taxes, they give you 5% in November and maybe 45% in December. Yes. So they have their own schedule, but the county can change that schedule anytime, pretty much. I would right. also like to add one thing here, and that is um, because the state of California's community college districts are sort of all facing this deferral um, situation, the pool trans that's being offered at, you know, you spoke about CM, I think they can be the repayment schedule in some ways can be tied to the receipt of deferred funds by the districts. So that is a possibility for us if if we choose to go into the pool or we choose to utilize it but nevertheless a tax and revenue anticipation note uh, issuance has a, a dedicated timeline in which they have to be repaid these are not long-term instruments they have to be repaid within the same fiscal year and so when you mentioned a few minutes ago that the last time there was a deferral situation and the state um, took a while to reimburse the districts or to provide the funds to the district, what we're seeing now is a targeted timeline in which those deferrals are going to be coming back to districts uh, in the months of the 2021-22 fiscal year. But, you know, that is still something that we're working with to make sure that that would happen. So I just want to make sure that people who are listening to this are um, really kind of understanding the situation with the repayment schedule. And even though, you know, the sort of the collateral would be property taxes or something like that, um, we, we are on the hook to pay this money back in a particular time frame. Uh, so, but we're... It's, it's not something that we can necessarily ignore because it is a cash flow situation, which means that in February, we have to have the cash to pay our bills, uh, which means you know salaries and benefits and all those other, other things that people um, depend on us for. Um, and so we're putting this here as an informational item 
because we have not actually applied for the trans, we have not actually gone forward with this, but this is just for information. And another caveat I just want you to know when you receive the funds that you are receiving this as a loan. So it is not your revenue, it is your right. loan and it does reflect in your balance sheet that you have borrowed the money on a temporary basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some ramifications, but at the end of the day, we wanted to make sure that uh, our employees are getting paid on time, the bills are getting paid on time, and there is no panic uh, out there for the district. All right. So thank you both, um, CM and Adil. Uh, it is uh, now 1.42, so maybe we can turn to some questions. And I'll let Mark uh, moderate those. Great. Can you hear me? Great, okay. So the first question that we had uh, was about um, basic aid districts. How are basic aid districts funded? I would like to see them, but I'm gonna basic aid or those are uh, getting property tax only. They don't get, they don't get enough, uh, they don't get a lot of uh, uh, state apportionment. Mostly everything comes from property taxes. And those uh, basic aid has a lot of money and uh, they're getting for the proper taxes compared to us. I don't know if uh, CM wanna add something else. Sure. I think when we say the word the basic aid district, it looks like they are poor district, but that's not the that's not the true terminology. They get basic aid. That means they don't depend on the state to provide any funding for the apportionment purposes. Uh, they are something called community supported district. Basically, their property taxes are greater than what are the calculated total computational revenue. So for those districts, they keep all the dollars for their own district over and above the total computational revenue. For, for 1920, pretty close to about $340 million worth of excess property taxes for seven or eight districts were retained at the district uh, throughout the state of California. So those districts fared well because they have it and they don't have to worry about getting the money from the state. Their problem is a little bit different because not getting the apportionment, so they only get that lot of money twice a year when the property tax gets collected. So they always have to make sure that they have enough cash to pay mm -hmm. their bills in a July, August, September, October. Uh, but that's called the basic aid district. So when your property taxes are greater than total computational revenue, you become basic aid district. And because the California have done such a wonderful job in so many communities, there are districts who are teetering just around to become a basic aid district. Uh, in next three to five years, we will see a few more districts become basic aid because they are, their neighborhoods are improving so much and turnover of the properties is taking place. So it looks like there will be a more district become basic aid in the future years. Sorry for the long answer. Well, that's great, thank you. Uh, another question came up when we were looking at the actual uh, detailed calculation of uh, the Peralta expenditures. And the question is, uh, if the 50% rule is a calculation on fund one only, why are we subtracting lottery? Uh, and the impression is that lottery funds are fund 11. No, we have two, uh, two lottery funds. We have restricted and unrestricted. We have two lottery funds, one for the general fund and one for a uh, restricted fund. Great. Thank you for that clarification, Adil. Um, you had mentioned, Adil, during your talk that it's really important for the district to meet the 50% requirement because there's a, 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 a strong penalty if we fail to meet that. Can you uh, tell us a bit about that penalty? What, what is the penalty? So uh, the, the, the cost is calculated, I think CM can answer to that. They, they calculate how much per percentage we have to return. The state will, 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 will calculate that. But, but I know that for, for, for facts that if you don't, let's say we, we're lending at 48% and 
and we have 2% uh, lower than the 50% law. And that may be a huge amount to pay for the state because they were mandated by the state law to reach the 50% law. So I will let uh, CM, who has a good experience on that, and he's a specialist on the 50% law, to explain more than what I said. Well, the first and foremost, uh, we wanted to know that as a district, we all make sure that we find a way and mitigate the 50% law no matter what. Uh, because the later of the law is extremely important to spend those expenses in a classroom. So that being said, sometimes unforeseen conditions do happen at district. If the district have some inclination early enough that they may not mitigate the 50% law with their reasoning, they can apply for the exception as a waiver to the Board of Governors in a timely manner. And once the Board of Governors can determine that you do have something called extreme circumstances that you are not able to meet 50% law, they may grant you outright waiver. So you don't have any penalty and the waiver can be granted. That being said, that is not something the Board of Governors would like to do either. Uh, they don't want to make this as a practice. Uh, if they don't grant you the waiver, that means they will allow you another year to mitigate. Uh, suppose you didn't meet it in, uh, say, 1920, they give you another year, 2021, to mitigate that. So whatever the deficit was on a prior year, if you can mitigate that in 2021, they will consider that you meet the 50% law. So they give you some leeway for the district to work on it. But if the district outright does not meet 50% law for one year, two year, three year, then there is a problem that they can be held the fund for or force the district to issue the additional expenses, warrants, or checks uh, to the instruction, instructional side of the house in order to meet the 50% law. So, but my, I have not seen the district have gone that far uh, in the state of California because all districts take a pride in meeting the 50% law. Uh, and for some reason, if they can't, they know well in advance, they go to the Board of Governors, they get the waiver and work hard to mitigate that. Thank you. So the um, Peralta calculation that Adil showed uh, was uh, basically 50.5%, and I'm rounding there. Um, what is the average statewide? How, do people um, come in just, you know, 50% or um, what, are, what are people shooting for across the state? No, so, uh, I can answer you. Some districts do have it at about 51, 52% but no district is running away with 60% or more or anything like that because it is almost impossible because it does have an impact on the other areas. But majority of the district will be somewhere between 50.5 and 51.5. Based on my experience, uh, working on three colleges, we're barely reaching 50.01%, 50 50.02%. Uh, not all college reaching uh, 51, 52%. Uh, what I believe the basic aid, uh, mostly uh, they don't reach the 50% law, but I think uh, they, they, they say, okay, what? Well, I'm not getting anything from the state anyway. So I know some Mateo, a couple of years ago, they didn't reach the 50% law and they were advocating why they, wa they have to reach the 50% law when they are basic aid. Great, thank you. Let's see, that's all the, the questions that we have in the q and A. I I I see another question that came in through chat. Uh, and the question is, did Peralta borrow any FTES from summer 2020? No. We don't do that since we started the, the SCIF, uh, July 1st, 2000, uh, for 18-19. We never did that. We used to do that on the pre uh, previous system. We used to borrow. Now we don't do that anymore since 1819 with the SCIF, we don't do that. I see, that's very clear. Um, that's all of the questions that we have uh, submitted so far. Uh, well, 
Okay, well, you know, since we have no other questions and we've covered the agenda here, I want to um, give a special thanks to both Adil and CM for providing this uh, webinar uh, content. I think it was very helpful and uh, it'll be um, accessible for people to listen to later. And, um, you know, should you have any topics um, that you would like to see in future webinars, we'd love to hear uh, what they might be uh, because uh, the information can be, you know, compiled and discussed and then put aside for later listening. So um, with that, I will again say thank you to Adil and, and uh, CM and then turn it back over to you, Mark. Great, thank you. Um, I will send out a, uh, an announcement with the uh, link to the slides and the recording of the video. We'll get that up on Peralta Gems too. Thank you everybody for dialing in and have a good afternoon. Thank you everybody. Thank you CM, thank you Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.